years ago, when some of the students were part of the organization, I think one of the name is Zukhrof, uh, they approached me with the idea of this speaking here at the TED event um, at the bike. Um, I said, what should we be talking about? You know, because, um, and, um, and, and Zukhrof probably said that anything that really, um, you're really passionate about anything, talk about something that you're really passionate about, that you really believe in. Um, and I first thought of maybe I should talk about media and freedom of expression or cyberspace and social media. But then I just blurted out and I just um, said that, can we talk about, can I talk about why none of the Muslim societies and countries is a genuine democracy? In fact, I would say none of the Muslim countries is a democracy. And she said, well, that's interesting, that's provocative. And someone also said, this is very interesting. I went on YouTube and I typed TED, TED Talks, Pakistan, and more than 80,000 more than 80,000 entries with different titles came up. They were kind of repetitions as well. And I looked through the titles and the subjects, and I realized that most of the TED Talks are about a personal dream, a personal achievement, a dream for Pakistan, a certain kind of industrial product, technology, art form, literature, design. I didn't come across, I couldn't find a single talk that touched religion or Islam. So I went to, back to YouTube, the main YouTube, and I typed Islam and democracy. And I came across more than 900,000 titles, almost a million titles. And within these titles, I started looking, surfing, started you know, viewing those videos. And I came across lectures and discussions and university talks by the likes of uh, Professor Tariq Ramadan, who is now at Oxford University, originally from Switzerland. Uh, and Shadi Hamid, the Iranian origin, who is a uh, scholar of Islam, the famous author for, who is now at the Brooklyn Institution, Institute in, in Washington, uh, and who has, was known for his book, Islamic Exceptionalism, a very popular book that came up a uh, short while ago. And then I also came across uh, the scholars from this part of the world. I mean, a lot, lot of the video stuff which you come across in the lectures you come across are from the Muslim spokespersons, scholars, from the Western world, but I also came across the scholars from this part of the world, the South Asia, Pakistan and India, like Zakir Naik and Dr. Israr and uh, Tariq Jamil, uh, Hamza Yusuf, and so many others, the list is endless. And I found, and I found a very interesting dividing line, a very interesting dichotomy as to how the two sets of scholars and commentators address the issue of Islam and democracy. Whereas the people who live in the West, the Muslims, the Muslim intelligentsia of the West, says, well, Islam and democracy are compatible. We don't see any problem, you know. Uh, Muslims are diverse, the Muslims are different. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia, Tunisia, Algeria, everything is different. So Islam and Muslim world is not a monolith. But when you look at the scholars that are there on the YouTube from South Asia, from this part of the world, you come across the argument that look, Islam and democracy are not compatible. Of course they are not compatible, because Islam is the word of God, and democracy is a system by the will of the people. And the question that comes to your mind is, that of course the God is not going to come down to the earth to interpret his word. He's not going to come down and explain what he meant by his word. That means Muslims, intelligentsia, the intellectual, and the Muslim people have to interpret the word of the God. And this is the question I want to leave in your mind, and maybe I get the opportunity to address it toward the end. But as a, as a critic and someone who is from the media and communication within the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, it is not my cup of tea, it's not my, uh, I, it's not for me to be talking about Islamophobia or the French allergy to hijab. I have to talk, I have to react, I have to be sensitized by what I see in this country, in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. And there, as a media and communication person, I saw in the last two or three months that how people, unknown people who we never heard of, the bloggers, were picked up by national security agencies because they were writing blasphemous contents. And I'm, as a common sense, thinking, what has national security agencies of a state have to do with blasphemy? And that's not it, that the matter disappeared without any explanation. One of the largest Facebook page, which had four million plus Pakistanis, 
سیاست ڈاٹ پی کے سڈنلی بوم ڈس اپیئرس فرام دا فیس بک اینڈ آئی فائنڈ اے ٹویٹ فرام دی سیاست ڈاٹ پی کے دس از وی وی جسٹ وی جسٹ لاسٹ اے پیج وی ڈونٹ نو واٹ ریئلی ہیپن سو آئی سینٹ اے ڈائریکٹ ٹویٹ ٹو دی ایڈیٹر آف دی سیاست ڈاٹ پی کے ہو واز ایکچولی ان کینیڈا آئی سیٹ ٹو واٹ ہیپن ہی سیز وی ڈونٹ نو اینی تھنگ آئی مین وی جسٹ ڈس اپیئر یو نو اینڈ وی ڈڈ آئی سیٹ ڈو گیٹ اے نوٹس اے نوٹیفیکیشن اینڈ الرٹ اے وارننگ بائی فیس بک دس وٹ دا اسٹینڈرڈ از ہی سیز نتھنگ وی جسٹ ڈس اپیئر دس اوکے اینڈ And he said, but we have found out that after the court trial, the government of Pakistan has entered into a secret agreement with the Facebook. And according to that secret agreement, you know, because Ahmed Bilal is here talking of agreements, so the government of Pakistan entered into a secret agreement, according to siyasat.pk. And as per the force of the agreement, Facebook has, take down, has to take down and suspend or take off every page which the government of Pakistan recommends to them is injurious to their interests. So I said, okay, what to do? I said, let me tell you something. I said, write an email to PTA, Chairman PTA, copy that to Secretary Interior, copy that to Secretary Information, copy that to such and such Secretary, and copy me on that, and copy all the television anchors, and copy all the editors of Express Tribune and Dawn, and you know, Pakistan Today, and Friday Times, and copy that to US Embassy, and copy that to everybody, and ask them, and ask them, You know, do you have an agreement with Facebook? Because we have just been down and Facebook is not even responding to our emails. And he did that, he copied me on that. And after 12 hours, the PTA responded that, look, we haven't done anything to siyasat.pk, we don't know what really happened to you. But you know, we have an agreement, but that is only, uh, we have signed an agreement with Facebook, but that's only related to the, uh, to the blasphemous content. But siyasat.pk was not blasphemous. Siyasat.pk is an opposition site. Is a, is, a, is a public debating thing followed by four million people since 2008. Since then, since Twitter is my weapon, since then I have been tweeting and I've been writing and I've been sending emails to, to all the government officials that you cannot sign a secret agreement with Facebook. Why it is important, I want you to understand that. Because I'm in television industry, I'm in media, I know the political narrative, the creative narrative of the Pakistan is not sh being shaped by televisions, it is not being shaped by Geo or Dunya or Express, it is not being shaped by ARY, it is not being shaped by Dawn and Express Tribune. The creativity of the Pakistani youth, 65% people in this country are less than 35 years of age. The creativity, the ideas of the Pakistani youth, the questioning is coming from the social media. 40 million Pakistanis are right now on Twitter and on Facebook and these are the people the executive authorities in this country, in all Muslim countries, uh, are afraid of. So I've been questioning this thing to all the government authorities, and to this point, I have not received any answer to this, that how can you enter into a secret agreement which has not been put to judicial review, which the Pakistani media, the civil society, the legal community, the judicial community have not really seen? How can you decide, how can PTA or interior ministry decide what is blasphemous. And how can you down pages like siyasat.pk or recommend to Facebook that you can down pages like siyasat.pk without giving them the right of audience and right of hearing? I haven't received any answer. So when I look, because I exist here, I'm not facing Islamophobia, hijab, French allergy to hijab is not my issue with so many Pakistanis keep on talking. My issue, my sensitivity, my reaction is towards what I see over here and when I see Professor Tariq Ramadan, who divides his time between Switzerland and Oxford University and American think tanks and Japanese universities and talks of the West's bias towards Muslim, or, or Shadi Hamid, uh, who talks of the Islamic exceptionalism, I feel like saying that stop the hypocrisy. Tell me how many Muslim countries run by Muslims, governed by Muslims, administered by Muslims, are genuine democracies, where there is genuine rule of law, where the minorities and minority point of view is protected. And minority point of view is very important. Minority point of view is not necessarily the point of view of a, Muslim, of a religious minority. It's a, point, it's a minority point of view in art. It's a minority point of view in literature. It's a minority point of view in science. It's a minority point of view in politics. Where is minority point of view, rule of law, liberal order being exercised in any Muslim country? While doing this research, I came across a paper, a research paper by a certain John Anderson whose God matters, written a few years ago. And they said that, which is, which is, which is a common theme, which is repeated in Western academic literature uh, again and again and again and again, 
which has been repeated by Huntington, Samuel Huntington, in his books by Francis Fukuyama, The End of the History. And the theme that recurs is that Muslim societies are not receptive for democracy. Somehow or the other, the democratic institutions do not take hold in the Muslim societies. Now, John Anderson's paper makes two exceptions. He says there are two exceptions, two surprising exceptions, where there are some form of democratic institutions. And what are those two exceptions? Turkey and Pakistan, according to that paper. Now in the year 2017, we can probably add Indonesia, Malaysia, and after the another, the political party's uh, uh, you know, uh, departure, we can probably add Tunisia to that. But the problem, which I think as a, as, as a commentator is, the Muslim country's definition of democracy is only restricted to two things. Absence of military on the top, yeah, military is not visible on the top, and holding elections. Otherwise, if you just look at Turkey, which has been referred to as one of the exceptions as a promising democratic country, I looked and checked no transition of power from one regime to the other in Turkey ever took place without the military's intervention. Situation in Pakistan is more or less the same. And now, when the Turkish military has become very weak and has been decimated and done to death, President Erdogan has completed 15 years in power and he's just held a referendum which gives him now authority, legitimacy and position and capacity to be in power for another 10 years. I mean, where in a Western liberal democracy you can even conceive of someone you know, thinking of this kind of luxury of staying in power for so long. You know, this, whenever the Muslim, moving to the next idea, from my childhood, school, college, university, television, media, newspapers, columnists, the only argument which we encounter from the Muslim scholars when they talk of Islam and democracy being compatible is khilafat e rashta the time period of the rightly guided caliphs. But then we forget to mention that how long ago that was, 1500 years ago. And we don't even talk that how, how, what was the duration of the khilafat e rashta 26 years, or maybe 30, that's it. What happened after this? Yes, we have the golden age of ideas. Muslims had the golden age of ideas between 8th and 11th century, 300, 350 years of the Abbasid era, when Muslims were at the cutting edge of modernity. Democracy is a modernity idea. So Muslims at the time were more democratic than any other society, any other civilization on the planet or the known civilization in terms, and also they made very original contributions to mathematics, to sciences, to physics, to chemistry. Algebra is a Muslim creation, chemistry and so on. But what happened then? No one talks about that. You know, in every television program, every column in Urdu newspapers, every, every discussion in any television, anywhere you go, in any university in this country you go, they just talk about the khilafat e rashta So what about the 1500 years that have passed since then? You know, how many original ideas, this is the other question I want to throw into your mind, how many original ideas Muslim scholars or teaching places have created in the last 800 years. Original ideas that have changed the world, that have impacted the world. How many times Muslim intellectuals have produced Kant or Schopenhauer or Marx or Nietzsche or, 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 or Sartre you know, or, or, or Burton Russell or, um, um, or even someone like George Orwell. I mean, what a brilliant dissection of the power in the modern age has been done by the Orwellian concept of George Orwell. If we read, if any one of you cares to read Animal Form, it's a small book you can read in two hours. Read Animal Form and you will realize it is no more about the Stalinist Russia, it is about this place. It is about this place. Read Animal Form and you'll find all the characters of Pakistani politics and society mentioned under different names in the Animal Form. So, coming to, uh, because when I was discussing that over the uh, TED talk, uh, one of the idea was that you must also mention the solutions. So when we talk, we move toward the solutions, I think I, I would address the question of the solution in the form of a question. How many of the people here sitting in this hall, and of those hundreds of thousands maybe that get to watch this video, have ever consciously realized, understood, in a very clear sense, the religions are ideas. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are ideas. And ideas have to be interpreted. 
Ideas cannot be fossilized in time and space. Ideas to remain ideas, ideas cannot be made of wood and stone or pulp. Ideas are living organic forms. For ideas to remain true to themselves, the ideas have to be interpreted and reinterpreted and have to be understood. And they have to be interpreted and reinterpreted with the help of the modern sciences and the knowledge. As I said in the very beginning, the God will not come down to earth to interpret his own idea. There's always a class of people that, that act in the name of the God. And this is happening across all the Muslim world where there is a small, is a class of vested interest that interprets religion uh, in the name of the God. The God is not coming here. And this brings me with the last thought which I want to leave with you. This question should take us to the 10th and 11th century, the time period, the brilliant time period. The only real brilliant time period of Muslim civilization is between the 8th and 11th century, the Abbasid time period. And that is the time period when the Muslims were at the cutting edge, at the cutting edge of the civilization. Every critic of Muslim civilization and Islam admits to the fact that Islam was the leading force that changed the world and transferred the Greek knowledge from the Greco and Roman world to the modern world and Islam was the connection. But there was the debate between Mutazalla and Ashariya. Mutazalla, Mutazallites or Mutazalla were the rationalists that believed that religion and God have to be interpreted through the principles of reason and rationality. And then there was a counter group of the Ashariya, the traditionalists that believe the revelation and word is more important than reasoning. The rationalists lost the debate a thousand years ago in 10th and 11th century. And, after, and we have a thousand years of fossilized thinking. No Muslim society or state will become genuinely uh, democratic unless we become genuinely modern. And we will not become genuinely modern unless we learn to dissect, interpret, and reinterpret the ideas. This is what I have to say. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.